Welcome to Divine Savior Church in Doral, Florida. Our mission is to change lives through Christ. We are committed to connecting people to Jesus because we believe Jesus changes lives. We do this through weekly worship across six campuses, connecting to God's word and others and serving our local communities. Please enjoy our weekly service. Thank you very much, worship team. And a welcome again to everybody who's here on 58th Street in Doral with us. And a welcome too if you're watching online somewhere else in the world. I want to start by asking just two questions to you. The first question is, do you believe that Jesus Christ died, rose from the dead, and lives forever in glory? Amen? Amen? Good. Good. But maybe not everybody does. And I hope that by the end of this church service, you do believe that. But here's the second question. Do you believe that you will die, rise from the dead, and that you will live forever with him in glory? And amen? And more amens? Good. If you believe the first one, you can be absolutely sure, 100% sure about the second one. In fact, it's the, the first, the answer to the first one gives you the assurance that the answer to the second one is yes, absolutely yes. And we heard that last week. As we began, I know I wasn't here preaching, but as Pastor Ben began you on this new sermon series, we're looking at the first letter that Peter wrote. And that's exactly what he said in verses 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. So we who believe that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead and now lives in glory, we can be sure that that exact same thing will be true in our case as well. That's our hope. That's our hope. And it's not an uncertain hope. Like, I hope I get my taxes done on time. And you may have had this terrifying thought in your head right now, when's April 15th? It's tomorrow, okay? I remember that, okay? So um, it's a 100% certain future reality that we we never have to doubt, Um, that there's an inheritance waiting for us, an eternal inheritance waiting for us in heaven. But we're still here. We still live in a world where we have to pay our taxes. (laughs) And last week, Peter also called us foreigners or strangers, in this, in this world. So he said it's, it's like we're strangers in a strange land. We're, we're foreigners who live here. Another way that, like maybe the Apostle Paul said it, was we're citizens of heaven. Like we have our citizenship. That's our hope. We, we have it, but yet we're not there yet. So it's like we're in the terminal waiting to board the plane that's going to take us to that eternal inheritance. But now the question is, what do we do? How are we supposed to live? How should we live now? Because We're different people now. Uh, God gave us a new birth. We're not the same people that we used to be. So so how should we live now? And that's in the second part of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 25. That's what Peter's going to talk with us about today as we go through it. So first of all, I want you to imagine that you are a slave in the Roman Empire at the time of Jesus. And you've been a slave since the day you were born. It's the only life you know. Every day, you have a set of tasks that you have to do for your master, and you have to do them well. And your master's watching you. And if you mess up, he's going to punish you. You live in fear of him, and you think in your heart, there's got to be something better than this. But you don't know what it is. This is the only life you know, and you're not sure how to get something better. But then, one day, something amazing happens. You go to the marketplace to buy food for your master, and there's a a man there who you don't know, and he approaches you, and he said, I would like to redeem you. I would like to pay the price to set you free so that you don't have to be a slave anymore. I'd like to pay the redemption price so you can be free from slavery. And you can hardly believe your ears are like, whoa. But he follows you home, back to your master's house, And he says to your master, I'd like to redeem your slave. Buy him out of slavery. And the master sets a price. It's a really high price. More money than you could ever dream of. 
But the man is perfectly willing to do it, and, and he pays the price. So as you're leaving the house with nothing, because you have nothing, you're a slave, right? So you're leaving the house with, the, with this man who's just redeemed you, and he said, you're free. You're not a slave anymore. But I would really like you to be my son. Would you come and live with me? And you can hardly believe your ears, but you barely squeak out the words, yes, I would like to be your son. So you go home with him. You spend the night, and the next morning you get up, and your, your new father can tell by the look on your face that you're just not sure about all this, that you're, that you're scared. He sees fear in your face um, because your old life is still kind of attached to you. And so he says, don't be afraid. You're not, my, you're not a slave anymore. You're my son. And I, I didn't redeem you in order to punish you. I redeemed you to, to love you. So if you make a mistake today, I'm going to forgive you. Don't be afraid. If that, was, that, that happened to you, <laughs> would you, do you think you'd ever go back to your former way of life? Would you ever go, say, you know, See you later. I'm going to go back to my former master and be a slave again. Would you ever do that? Absolutely not. We wouldn't. You have now a, a loving and generous father who redeemed you, and you have every reason to stay with him and, and receive his love and, and to love him back because he set you free. Jesus talked about this spiritual truth in John chapter 8. He said, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And that's what Jesus did for all of us. He redeemed us. He set us free from the slavery of sin, from the slavery of death, from the slavery of hell. But the ironic thing is that while we're still here on this earth, there's a part of us that still wants to go back. Still wants to go back to that old life of slavery. And that's what Peter tells us in this, this second half of chapter 1. Be the person who God says you are. Be the person who God says you are. There was a teenager who became a Christian through the influence of one of his friends. And his mom was not a Christian. And when she heard that he had become a Christian, she was alarmed because she thought, oh, some cult has brainwashed my son. And she told him that. And he said, Mom, it's not like that at all. But if you knew the stuff that was in my brain, it really needed washing. And, and God was the only one who could wash it, and, and he has. And it's a good thing. Our minds are, are amazing, aren't they? Our minds have this awesome capacity to process information, to store information. It's all happening right now. They say that everything that we've ever heard, everything we've ever seen or experienced is stored up here. It's just that the older you get, the harder it is to find that file folder, right? But it's all up there. And, and it's something, our mind is something that can be influenced, and it's something that actually influences us too. And Peter felt it was important enough to mention, so he says this in verse 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So literally, it's like prepare your minds for action. Get them ready for action. There are so many things in our lifetimes, sinful things that we allow in the door, right, of our mind. Sinful thoughts, sinful ideas and philosophies, sinful images, and, and those are things that lead us into sin. Peter realizes that, and so he says, focus on something else. Don't bring those things out of your memory banks. Don't let more of that in. Instead, focus on your hope. And what is our hope again? The hope of an eternal inheritance in heaven. It's like when you, when you do that, when you focus on that hope that you have, you'll realize how valuable it is. The more you focus on it, the less you will want to lose it. The more you will want to do everything to avoid losing it. The more you'll want to be like your father. So what's God like? How many sermons do you think we could preach on what God is like? Kind of every sermon is, like what, is on what God is like, but we could preach tons and tons of sermons about the attributes of God. 
But one of the attributes that, that Peter's going to highlight here is holiness. And holy means what? Separated from sin and all wrongdoing. Basically perfect, right? It says God is holy. He's perfect. And now, now Peter's going to tell us, okay, be the person that God says you are and be like him. Seek holiness in your life. It says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. We heard that word in uh, the first lesson for today, ignorance, right? But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. There's a, a growing segment of people in, in our country that are called, well, I would say like dem, people who study demographics call them nuns, N-O-N-E-S, because if you gave them a, a survey and said, uh, you know, like with a bunch of check boxes, check the religion that you practice, they would check None. I don't practice any religion. Or if you ask them, do you, do you practice a religion? They'd say no. There's a growing number of people in our country who are being brought up that way, right? To, to have no knowledge of the Bible. To not know at all the God of the Bible. And they really live in ignorance. In fact, on, over at Easter time, I saw on TV, someone went out with a microphone on the street and asking people, what do you think East, what's Easter all about? And I just cringed a bunch of times at the answers that, that they gave, like truly cringed. It was like there's so much ignorance. And, and someone who's ignorant of, of, of God and, and his word uh, is not going to live the way God wants either. And, and when we see that, we might be disgusted, we might be angry, and there's no excuse for it. But we also have to remember that that's where we used to be. That you and I used to be just as ignorant just as lacking in knowledge of God, just as lacking in faith. But that all changed. That changed when the Holy Spirit did his work in us. In your case, in my case, it might have been when we were baptized. It might have been later on in life when we came to know who Jesus is and, and, and believed in him. Or maybe it hasn't happened yet <laughs> for you. I pray, I pray that it does. Um, but at that moment, God looked at us and said, you're my child. I'm your father forever. I choose you. I forgive you. I adopt you. You're mine. You're redeemed. And so that's why Peter says, be the person God says you are. A redeemed child of God. Look in the mirror and say, that's who I really am. And that's who in my life I really want to be. He says in verse 17, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. So slaves are afraid of their masters. But believers are not afraid of God. We're not afraid of him, but we do fear him. But that's kind of a confusing concept. What does it mean to fear God? And I have a little illustration. I don't know if this will help. But I, I have a... I have a string here, and then I have, uh, it's a, a nut, like a big metal nut, and I've tied it securely to the, to the string, I hope at least, and I'm going to, and I'm going to go like this, and I'm going to start swinging it. I hope that it doesn't hit me, or you, pray for me. Those of you, and there are smart people here, what are the two physical forces that are happening, occurring here? Well, gravity for sure. There are two physical forces that are working, that are balancing each other out. There's centrifugal force and centripetal force. Not even the science teachers are answering, okay? Because they're afraid that they're going to get the wrong question. So here's a, here's a little illustration. So centrifugal force is the force that the heavier object is, is exerting on the string. It's pulling outward. Centripetal force is the force exerted by the string on the object, and it's pulling inward, and the two balance each other out. And I think maybe that can help us understand what it means to fear God. If you think of it like this, the centrifugal force that's, fo that's pulling out is God's holiness and majesty. That's the thing that makes us bow in awe before him, in awe and wonder and respect uh, before this God who created the whole universe with a single word. <laughs> that... Holiness is like the centrifugal force that keeps a reverent distance between us and God. So that we say, yeah, my Father is holy. My Father's holy. It keeps that reverent distance. But the centripetal force, the force that's pulling in, 
We could compare that to God's grace, his undeserved love for us, which shows us mercy and which embraces us with his love and, and pulls us in into his warm embrace. So he's pulling us toward us. And so those two forces, you know, God's holiness and God's grace are, are balanced. When we fear God, we realize that. And that's why Peter says, um, I'll read it again, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. He says, you can be 100% sure that God loves you. 100% sure of that, of that warm embrace of God. But at the same time, realize who your father is. Realize that he's holy and just and without sin. And that will help you to be the person that God says you are. So, gossip seems like a lot of fun, right? It's fun to hear dirt on people. Why? Why is it fun to hear dirt on other people? How does it make you feel? It makes you feel good about yourself, right? Ooh, I'm glad I'm not that stupid. I'm glad I didn't do that. But it hurts other people. It just hurts other people. And so God says, don't do it. We might think that we're going to get some pleasure out of lust, and we might get some pleasure out of lust. But God says, look for pleasure in the right place. Not there. Cheating. We have a lot of people who are tempted to cheat, and a lot of people in this room who are trying to keep people from cheating, right? We have a lot of teachers here, right? So, so whether it's copying someone else's paper or whether it's using AI to write that big paper, hoping that the teacher won't know, God says, that's dishonesty. Your father is honest. So be honest, not dishonest. It's not easy to live in harmony in marriage, right? Even if you both have the same favorite color. It's hard. And the solution might seem the easiest solution. Well, it's just Forget it. We'll start over with somebody else. Get a divorce. But God says, what I have joined together, let no one separate. That's not the answer. I'm the answer. My love is the answer. It's easy to think that whatever your problem is, no matter what it is, if you had more money, you'd feel happier, right? But if you trust in money, it becomes your God, and it replaces the true God who really is the solution to, to all your problems, any problem that you might have. A while ago, I told you the story about the, the slave who was redeemed by a, a loving and generous father. And I asked you, if that was you, would you go back to slavery? And we all said, no, absolutely not. But spiritually speaking, we do, right? Spiritually speaking, we, we go back <laughs> to that old master of sin. We get attracted back. Ironically, even though that's not who we are anymore, we, we get attracted back to our old master of sin. And we sometimes serve that master. If you were at, who shops at TJ Maxx? Anybody? All right, Diane does, at least. Okay, good store. If you were at TJ Maxx and you found a blouse that was $8 and you really liked it, would you buy it? Ladies. Okay, yes. All right. How would you treat it? Maybe like an $8 blouse, right? But what if you found out, what if you looked at the original price tag and it said $150? Would you treat it differently? Maybe. <laughs> it's a $150 blouse, right? So maybe you treat it like an expensive thing. And that, unfortunately, we, even as Christians, because we still have a sinful nature, we forget the cost. The cost of our redemption. How much it costs our Father to redeem us. It cost him his costliest thing. And so these verses are comforting. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. An empty life is one that is spent um, listening to the, the sinful desires and impulses that come out of our hearts and into our minds. An empty life is one that's spent gathering the ideas and philosophies of this world and, and believing them. 
An empty life is one that's a, it's a, a meaningless pursuit of pleasure, of meaning, and purpose that really gets you nowhere and really only eventually will get you to hell. That's empty. And that's where all of us were heading. But God didn't want it to be that way. So like even before the, the creation of the world, even before time, Peter says, he planned it all out. He said, I'm going to send my son to rescue them. I'm going to send him to redeem them, to buy them back. And so God, because Jesus suffered our punishment, we won't have to suffer that punishment. We get released from it. Normally, blood will cause a stain. That's hard to get out. But the blood of Jesus takes away the stain. It takes the stain of all of our sin and all of our wrongdoing away. God charged Jesus as guilty. He made him guilty of our sins. And now he's declared us not guilty. And that's the message of Easter. Like when God opened up Jesus' tomb to show that he wasn't there, that was a proclamation to you, to me, to the whole world. You're all not guilty. You're all not guilty. And nothing you did before you believed in Jesus and nothing you do after you believe in Jesus could contribute anything to that. Only the blood of Jesus could do that. And the result is freedom. We're free. Free from condemnation. Not going to be condemned. <laughs> free from threats of the law. We're free from, we're free from that, that impossible burden of saying, i got to be perfect in order to get to heaven because God has already given us that. That's our hope. It's his free gift to us an eternal inheritance in heaven. And we're free now to serve God, to serve that loving and generous Father who redeemed us, to be the people that he called us to be, that he says we are. They say like father, like son, right? And that could be good or that could be bad, depending on what kind of a father you had. But in our case, it's good because our father is good and he's the one who gave us new birth. And now, now we can imitate him, can be like him. And, and in this last section, um, Peter highlights perhaps the greatest of God's attributes and says, do this. This is a way to be the person that God says you are. He says, now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Has anybody ever been to Philadelphia? Raise your hand if you've been to Philadelphia. Is it nice? Never been there. Okay. But I know Philadelphia. Actually, the word Philadelphia is found in our text. It's the Greek word called Philadelphia. Um, that means like sincere love for one another. That's why Philadelphia is called the city of brotherly love. Mm -hmm. And so that's what Peter urges us to do. He says, that's a way to show who you are, is by loving each other. He's talking about believers loving each other. Will you find lots of sincere, deep, committed, unconditional love in Philadelphia? Will you find it here in Miami or in Doral? Will you find it on social media? Nope. Will you find it at a political rally? <laughs> Probably not. Usually we find the opposite of those things, uh, just self-interested love. <laughs> Right? But every Christian church is Philadelphia. Every, our Divine Savior Church is Philadelphia because here, people who've been changed, people who've been transformed by the Holy Spirit, gather. And here's a place where people who've been transformed can look at anybody who comes in the door and, and say, we can say, um, no matter who you are, because I serve a God who loved me so fully and completely and freely and unconditionally, then I want to love you that way as well. I want to be who he says I am. I'm his child. And I want to be like my father, and I want to love you the way he loves me. If you don't have a Philadelphia, Divine Savior Church would like to be your Philadelphia. We'd like to be your family in Christ. And here you'll find people who trust that Jesus is the answer for our greatest problem, which is sin. And people who believe that Jesus is the answer for every other problem we might have. Here you'll find people who trust in a father who's not a slave master. We don't have, we're not afraid of God. We reverently fear him because we know how much he loves us and how much he sacrificed. He sacrificed everything so that we could have everything. We're not perfect, but we want to be the people who God says we are. And we're trying to do that more and more every single day. And we gather here 
regularly around the living and enduring Word of God so it can fill us up. So it can take those other things out of our mind, so it can fill us up with things that last forever, not earthly things that are going to disappear someday and that really have no eternal value whatsoever. It'll fill us up with forever things. God's free and full forgiveness. The ability and the desire to truly love one another. And the hope of an eternal inheritance in heaven where there's nothing but Philadelphia. Amen? Amen. God's peace be with all of you through Jesus. Amen.